Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on February 21st. Just a reminder, this is on the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program. So we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. I should note that the mod list in the video description may be a little bit out there because that's from 32-bit and we're in 64-bit now with some extra visual mods. The first thing I wanted to do was to test uh, ISRU system an NC2 resource utilization system that would suck in carbon dioxide from the surface of Mars and then take water that is stored, break up the water into liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and then combine the liquid hydrogen with the carbon from the carbon dioxide and turn it into methane. And so that's what you see me doing here. It takes a lot of power, hence the huge solar panels. I wanted to check out the rate of conversion and make sure it was appropriate for this size of a system. And it was alright for a system that is meant to refuel a Mars Ascent vehicle in 16 months, which is its goal. Uh, you'll notice that no carbon dioxide or hydrogen was popping up because it was immediately being converted. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to do was to refuel that little uh, hub that we had sent over to the moon that also had life support for our new lunar station. And so this is basically a fuel transfer vehicle. Of course, getting fuel over to the moon is a bit of a trick, and I decided to launch this on a Falcon Heavy. The stage being used to transfer the fuel to the moon is a Vinci engine, and I've grown to like that engine, as long as it actually gimbals, of course. Anyway, here we go with the Falcon Heavy launch, and we're actually launching out of Brownsville in Texas. And the goal here for me was to see how far the core stage of the Falcon Heavy actually could get. Uh, in this case, I'm not reserving any fuel in the boosters. I don't think I reserved any fuel in the boosters. But I wanted to see whether the core stage could, in theory, get to Cape Canaveral. You notice I've throttled down the core stage. I set the core stage engines, the nine engines, to a particular group and use engine group's controller in order to throttle them down. That's something that comes with realism overhaul, by the way. So you can do that too if you're using realism overhaul. And that'll allow the core stage to last longer than the boosters, otherwise they'll all go out at the same time, which would be bad. So this is just seeing the maximum range of the core stage. But I'm not reserving any fuel in the boosters, so it's not really how the Falcon Heavy would work, per se. Okay, getting ready for the boosters out, and separation. Separation was a little bit more vigorous than I think it would be, especially if they want those boosters back. Uh, probably they'll be much gentler on the decoupling, so that they can orient properly. Okay, here we go. And that's the core stage out. Still over the Gulf of Mexico right now. Separation. And the ignition of the Merlin 1D. I am, however, happy to report that, oh wait, there's the decoupling of the procedural fairings, which don't work very well in 64-bit. The trajectory of the core stage would take it well beyond Florida, as of our decoupling. Of course, we were in a very high arc. We were at the nap apoapsis of about 336 kilometers, but you can see Florida there. And actually, it would have ended up uh, well into the Atlantic Ocean around the Bahamas. But that's only if the boosters were uh, spent completely so and no fuel was saved in the core so uh, anyway it's doubtful that they would ever try to land it in Cape Canaveral but it was just an interesting experiment okay so we have separated the payload but the payload has to sort of wiggle its way out from between the fairings and that's what it's doing here not the best way to go certainly not scenic would really like to avoid this in the future after all, in 64-bit with all the visual mods, it really makes me want to do some cinematics, but then the cin cinematics would be blown to bits by the fairing not releasing properly. So that would be a big downside. Anyway, here we go. Finishing our orbit. So the upper stage of the Falcon 9 Heavy will be deorbited. And there we go. We are in a nice orbit, and with plenty of juice left to transfer to the moon on this stage. First things first though, obviously get the solar panels out to make sure it remains charged. The antennae are out, and there's the docking port being opened, though that's not really necessary at this point. 
This is the intended transfer to the moon. I just wanted to get it close to the moon. No need for a free return or anything. I would like to match the orbit of our target, which is a little bit weird. It's highly inclined and eccentric. So it's going to be a tough rendezvous. But we do have a lot of fuel to work with. You can see down there, total delta V 12,000. And that's because it is a refueler. So it's just a bundle of fuel. Okay. That's the end of the burn for the moon. And this is the resulting trajectory being corrected a bit by RCS. I decided that the inclination that we had was a bit unfortunate, so a mid-course plane change was in order. And so trying to correct in order to better match our target. And in fact plotting for a potential rendezvous, which is optimistic at this point obviously. But, you know, always good to have something to aim for. The mid-course correction was accomplished using RCS, and then we were in Lunar SOI. The critical burn would be not quite at periapsis, a little bit further away from that because we wanted to correct our inclination as well. So here it goes, expending this stage. And that got us to a pretty decent orbit already. Most of uh, lunar orbit insertion burn is just to get it down to a low orbit around the moon. And that's the end of this engine. So, checking everything out. I should mention that the Vinci stage actually had some 300 Newton cryogenic thrusters for selling the fuel down. I don't know if they worked right here, but we'll see them again later on and I'll discuss them further. They're from the European Space Agency, developed a 415 uh, second ISP little thrusters for vernier thrusters and for ullage purposes. Anyway, here we go, continuing with the rendezvous burns. Obviously, our initial burn around the moon did not immediately bring us to the target as I optimistically plotted, but we did fix it up and here we are heading towards our target now. Still a long ways off though. But we closed the gap and I reoriented the little docking module with its life support to make the docking easier. There you go, lunar station life support and docking. This thing we're gonna try and grab. Getting closer. Remembering we have to do this reasonably accurately, at least compared to the stock game. Still like 7,000 meters per second in the refueling craft. Quite a lot. But of course, there's not much going on there. Okay, all right, connection, and we are docked, which means we can move this along to its destination, which is the station around the moon, which was created by Aronin. That station didn't have enough uh, life support for long stays, and so that was the main purpose of this module. Uh, we're speeding on right by, I didn't start the, the retro burn or velocity matching burn in time. Uh, we hadn't named it yet at this point. I forget if we finally came up with a name. I think we did. But the name escapes me at this uh, right now. Okay, so I put all the fuel into the little uh, docking module there and got it over to the station. And then we'll have to remove the lander, the lunar lander, from the station and dock this in between the lander and the forward station module. So, backing away with the lander. We've got two Kerbals inside, Peaceful Herbs and Adol 42. Two viewers. And then we shift the module into the center there. And you can see why we needed the extra docking ports. The station really only has one main docking port otherwise. There's one propellant only docking port on the front end. Okay, getting close. Don't know if this was the best orientation. I suppose it's serviceable. The station does have thrusters there. I suppose we could bring in the antennae on the docking module. I don't think there's anything else in the way otherwise. Okay. 
Alright, we've got a dock, and now the lander has to come in. Little bit of skew there. Will it work? It's a little bit off. Oh. Bit of a pause. Some sign of magnetism, but not quite. Oh dear. Can we force these two together? I think at this point I'm just hoping for some extra magnetism here. Uh, they're coming together. Alright. Okay, job done. And so I turn to the next thing, which is the return vehicle, which is supposed to bring Kerbals back from Mars. Or at least uh, this is the part that actually air breaks at Earth. Um, it would be docked up to some sort of HAB module, which would continue in an Earth-Mars orbit, rather than actually stopping at Earth. So we have to check out whether this can actually aerobreak at Earth after its journey. First, I'm dropping the periapsis using RCS. And so that will ensure that the transfer stage is going to re-enter. And then we separate, and then we adjust. Now remember this has the 24 Super Dracos in 12 pairs and that's mainly because of the need to allow it to be used as a launch escape system. It really doesn't need all that thrust here, but it could be useful. Now on a transfer back from Mars it would use about 2600 meters per second, maybe more than that to catch up to the HAB vehicle that's going back and forth the cycler. Uh, it's about that much. So it would have some left over. We see that it has 3,600 meters per second altogether. So even if it used 3,000, that's 600 it could use to slow down. And I intend to try that out. I don't know, I, maybe I should have just had it hit the atmosphere uh, full force in retrospect. But I did want to keep Griffin safe. So here we are, using the Super Dracos to retroburn keeping the periapsis to around 76 kilometers. And that's how I approach the atmosphere. Now it's an odd configuration because it keeps its fuel tank and the life support. And the heat shield is at the bottom of the fuel tank and the super dracos are sort of sticking out. You can see a lot of ablation is happening. Ablator is diminishing very quickly, but we didn't get any overheating signals or anything like that. So. As far as not overheating, it looked pretty safe. The downside is that it didn't seem to slow down much. You know, after the retro burn, our periap uh, sorry, our apoapsis hasn't gone down very much. So we haven't actually caught much drag. Considering how much ablation was happening, we probably couldn't try to go any deeper. Well, we could go somewhat deeper, but not too much. Otherwise, we completely lose our blader. Remember, the point of this, the reason why this is not going to come straight down to the surface of the Earth is because we don't want to carry a heavy heat shield with us. If we want it to come straight down, we need a pretty substantial heat shield to protect it. Instead, it's just going to catch around Earth. And maybe just uh, using the Super Dracos would be enough for that. Anyway, I put it into a stable orbit. Griffin still has quite a lot of food and food, water, and oxygen to use, so he'll be alright. Next up, we have a satellite to Jupiter. We happen to be at the Jupiter transfer window. And so I prepare a new satellite for Jupiter. And we already have one on the way, but I wanted this to be able to scan one of the moons of Jupiter uh, for resources. And so we have a lot of scanner material, plenty of RTGs. And I try to pack as much Delta V as I can in the transfer stages and that will be launched on top of an SLS Block 2, which is the largest rocket that we can expect to use, though maybe uh, SpaceX will be coming up with something else. And I, I've been working on that sort of rocket, but for now, SLS Block 2. And here I am time warping to what may or may not be the optimal point, but anyway, it's in line with the plane of the system, the ecliptic. And we look to be ready to go a little bit past. And ignition. 
and launch. Again, video sped up a bit, but actually this, this is using the SSTU Labs parts, so it's not too bad. Uh, low poly count and everything, so relatively high frame rates for a rocket of this size. Since we are using the Jupiter transfer window, we are going straight to Jupiter, and hence the need for all the Delta V. For SLS Block 2, we are using the Perios boosters, two boosters each with two F1Bs. And the reason I decided to do that is because I'm not really confident about the statistics of the possible SRBs that might be used. Uh, there is an SRB variant that may be adopted, but this is a little bit more solid as far as I'm concerned. Alright, there we go, separation of the boosters. It's a little bit easier to figure out the stats of the SLS Block 2 if you have the Perios boosters. Now here we're using the core stage, which is four of the space shuttle main engines, RS-25D slash E's. And there they go, let's hit for the core stage. And ignition of the next stage, I replaced the normal four RL-10C1s with a single J2X. And so that's what we've got here, and that's simply because of expediency, certainly not efficiency. The RL-10 uh, C1s would have been more efficient, they have better ISP, and they're lighter. I managed to get the fairings off, I think I tuned up the separation force and torque as much as possible, and of course I made it in four pieces in order to help it get off properly, but it just barely cleared the vehicle. So we did launch out of Brownsville again, hence we are passing over Florida now. Come to think of it, I think it's because we launched from Brownsville that we still had two degrees of inclination. Anyway, uh, here we are getting close to orbit. A little bit of a camera wobble to indicate a good semi-major axis and... Engine shutdown, 246 by 227 and here I am plotting for the Jupiter transfer. Hitting Jupiter is really easy. Getting a really good pass at Jupiter is the tough part. And so I wanted it nice and flat, going in the same direction as the moons, and relatively tight around Jupiter so that we could use as little fuel as possible to retroburn there. Okay, here I am using the 300 Newton Cryogenics, again 450 seconds of ISP, burning hydrogen and oxygen in order to turn the vehicle and so you, and of course to sell the fuel for the J2X as well. The benefit of using them of course is so you don't have to carry extra MMH and N204 in these stages and uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good benefit as long as they work right. Alright, they don't have much force as you'll see soon. I decouple and that's uh, three Vinci engines right there. I activate them, they extend their nozzle. Then I light the 300 Newton thrusters to try and sell the fuel down again. But you can see it's not really pushing us very far. Um, I don't know why that is. They should be a little bit more feisty than that. But anyway, the Vinci engines light and we get set. So uh, the 300 Newton thrusters, I just made a configuration for the one kill Newton thrusters. Uh, to modify them into this type of engine. They're cute little ullage rockets, basically. They have limited ignitions, uh, far more limited than even the Vinci engines, so I just leave them burning throughout this burn. It's not like I could use them again. I think they have like four ignitions or something like that. So they can't be used as like RCS thrusters or anything. Okay, here we go. Looks like uh, we're sort of close to what we planned, except high inclination. Not what I wanted, so we have to plot a mid-course plane change, and that I decided to do in the next episode because at this point I was getting rather tired. I probably had been streaming for seven to eight hours. So yeah, I left the exact plotting for next time and just put a dummy sort of uh, alarm in place to make sure I knew what to do. Alright, so with that I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.